Hey everyone, this is Brown at I have Brown, and tonight we are going to be talking about Forever Night, Season 1 on DVD. So, Forever Night was a show that was created in 1992 by some gentlemen named Barney Cohen and James D. Pario, and I hope I'm saying the latter's last name right, apologies if I'm not. But Forever Night lasted from 1992 to 1996, uh, running for a total of three seasons and 70 episodes. So all in all, not a bad run at all. And it's a show that combines elements of um, crime drama, um, horror, as well as gothic romance. And it's a rather interesting um, mixture of genres, and the result is a, a genuinely unique show. And it's a show that you could tell has served as an influence and inspiration to, um, to say, similarly supernatural uh, themed TV, TV shows that have come after it over the years. And I honestly um, rather enjoyed this uh, first season, um, all 22 episodes of which are collected in this um, DVD set here. And it's a it's a show that I remember a lot of people talking about, such as say members of my family as well as uh, co-workers who all actually watched the show when it originally aired. So they were there on the ground floor, so to speak. And I was just a kid when the show was on, um, so it was you know probably you know too say mature for young eyes, so to speak, but. You know, I um, recently just had the opportunity to be able to check the show out, and I haven't seen seasons two or three yet, but recently finished watching uh, season one, and uh, I liked it. It was it was fun. Um, you could definitely tell where, uh, say, things have um, improved a lot since the show originally aired. Um, you know, the quality of uh, TV production has gone up immensely since 1992 or 93. But at the same time, uh, for when this show was made, it was very groundbreaking. And even uh, though the majority of the episodes were predictable, uh, the writing itself um, was of such quality uh, that you were, at least I found myself wanting to go along for the ride, even if I knew, had a good feeling as to how, say, uh, certain events were going to play out. But another uh, factor that played into, say, my little willingness to go along for said ride was the fact that the um, characters um, are unique in and of themselves, but they were also uh, played by some very good actors. And so um, there is a level of attachment that comes into play to where you actually care about what's going on, um, even if you can, um, say, predict more often than not how things are going to turn out. But it's just, you know, the fact that, you know, the quality um, of the show, at least as far as the first season goes, sort of um, balanced out, you know, the predictable nature of it. Um, but... Another thing that made the show n noteworthy, in my opinion, was the music that was composed by a gentleman named uh, Fred Mullen, and he did the um, soundtrack of the show, you know, the, the score and what have you, um, but he also had um, a, a woman named uh, Lori Yates um, perform vocals on, on some of the songs, and or some of the tracks, if you will, and so you know, from, um, I guess, a, a purely musical standpoint, uh, this show uh, was very memorable as well. And the score tended to, you know, fit in with whatever was going on um, on screen. And it really tapped into, say, um, the nature of um, the, some of the characters on the show. And, uh, you know, so all in all, you, you've got just a good mixture of ingredients that, you know, make for a solid first season. And so the story of Forever Knight, um, it tells the story of um, a gentleman by the name of Nicholas Knight, who is a detective in Canada. And he uh, has uh, 
been on the job um, for uh, a, a decent amount of time to enough to where he has a rapport with the, the police department. Uh, but there are some uh, things about him that make him, you know, stand out from the crowd, so to speak. Uh, namely, the fact that he is um, a vampire who is a little over 800 years old. Um, and he was turned back in the 13th century. And originally, he was a rather bloodthirsty individual who ran with a crew of similarly bloodthirsty individuals. Uh, but over time, you know, he began to, uh, you know, feel remorse for his actions and tried to go out of his way to, say, um, pursue a prey that was, say, more um, criminal in nature, so to speak. Um, but he, um, in the time that he's been working with the police department, though, um, he's been trying to find a way to cure his vampirism, to become human again. And in that um, point, uh, there is a woman named uh, Natalie Lambert, who is a forensic specialist, who is the one who is actually uh, trying to work on the cure in question. And she's um, one of the few uh, mortals who actually knows uh, Nicholas Knight's secret. And, you know, he, uh, the, his cover story, uh, in order to be able to say, you work exclusively at night in the police department is that he has um, he, he is allergic to sunlight and that's a condition that while it's rare is not entirely unheard of and so um, you know he's able to he was able to float the story uh, by his superiors and you know they're like okay you know you you, you want to work you know nights only you got the job you know because he was that good at what he did and so, um, you know, he and uh, Dr. Lambert, you know, they've become, uh, you know, friends over the, over the time that they've worked together. And there's definitely um, a sense of um, camaraderie there. And, uh, you know, they genuinely care for each other. Um, but the, it's one of those deals where uh, he, there are times where he has to remind her that, hey, I'm a blood drinking, you know, monster here. Um, so you can't just tread lightly with me. You know, but at the same time, you know, she's, you know, trying to say that, hey, you know, you're trying to overcome your nature. You're trying to be a better person, you know, and yes, we're trying to work on a cure, you know, for your, you know, vampirism. But in the meantime, though, you know, you are making progress as far as, you know, being um, better than your nature and rising above it. And so, you know, you have this, you know, character who, because of what he is, he does have to drink blood, but it's animal blood, you know, which usually results in, you know, something that's um, less than appetizing for him because um, human blood is what vampires enjoy the most, um, you know, but, you know, because of um, what he's trying to do, uh, how he's trying to, you know, cut back on, you know, his, his nature, uh, he, uh, he has to make some sacrifices, uh, but he's been able to make do over, over the, the time that, you know, he's been working with the police department and, uh, specifically Dr. Lambert. Um, but another, uh, person who is involved is a detective, uh, named, uh, Don Skanky. Uh, and his last name is spelled S-C-H-A-N-K-E. So it, um, it sounds like Skanky, uh, but it's spelled differently. But uh, Skanky is a, a, a guy who, um, you know, he's been on the force for, you know, a number of years. And he, you know, he's seen some weird things. Uh, but at the same time, you know, he's still getting used to working with someone as odd as uh, Detective Knight. Uh, mainly because, I mean, he very rarely sees him in the daytime. Uh, he, he doesn't really know his entire story. Uh, he's never seen him eat anything. Um, and so it's just, you know, there's a lot of quirks that, um, you know, Skanky's having to, you know, get used to with uh, 
Detective Knight, you know, but at the same time, you know, I mean, Skanky, uh, you know, he's a, he's a good guy, you know, he's, he's got a family at home, and so, you know, he's, um, you know, takes his job seriously, but at the same time, you know, he, you know, likes to goof around and has some fun, too, you know, because, I mean, you know, in order to balance out the grim nature of the job, you know, you know, he, you have to find, you know, the joy in the small things, you know, so to speak, and so, um, his, uh, good-hearted nature, um, it clashes with the uh, Detective Knight's, um, I guess you could say, intense nature, uh, or personality, you know, but the two, it's interesting, because you see the two kind of rub off on each other, I mean, there'll be moments where, um, you know, Skanky will become, will be picking up on some of, uh, you know, Knight's intense characteristics, you know, depending on what the situation is, then there'll be times where, you know, you know, Detective Knight will be, you know, seemingly picking up on, you know, some of, um, Skanky's, um, say, witty, you know, witticisms or, you know, snarky comments. And so it's interesting, you know, seeing the two of them rub off on each other in that regard. But, um, at first, you know, it's, they, they, it's difficult, they have a difficult time, um, working together initially, but, you know, once, uh, they sort of, uh, you know, patch, you know, patch things up and work through, you know, say their differences of personalities, I mean, they find that they work rather well together, you know, they make for an oddball team, so to speak, but that's one of the things that makes the show a little more unique, but, um, as far as, uh, you know, their superior goes, uh, Captain uh, Stone Tree, um, you know, he's, he tends to cut them, you know, more slack than he should, in his opinion, uh, but at the same time, you know, I mean, it's not every day you have, you know, a detective, you know, who is as competent as Detective Knight is, but who is um, also, you know, suffering from a condition that, you know, prevents him from working in the daytime, and so, you know, not a lot of, you um, you know, people are as fond of working on the night shift as Detective Knight is, and so Stone Tree, you know, he takes his, um, you know, opportunities where he can, and so, you know, that's why he's able to, you know, pair up uh, Detective Knight and Detective Skanky, you know, as, you know, well as he was able to. Um, you know, oftentimes, though, um, because of Knight's vampiric nature, um, you know, Stone Tree finds himself, you know, having more questions and answers on some cases, and he doesn't know that Knight's a vampire, and neither does Skanky, but, you know, both guys, you know, there'll be times where, you know, they're both trying to figure out, okay, what's going on with this guy here, or, you know, why did things turn out this way on, on this case, or that way on that case? I mean, the case is closed, but there are some things that make the cases a little odder than they normally would be, say, with someone other than Knight, um, but, you know, that's, uh, and that's on the side of law and order, um, as far as, say, um, the vampire side of things, um, there was a, um, there's a vampire named, uh, Jeanne, who, uh, Jeanne, yeah, that's how you say her name, uh, Jeanne, who is a vampire who, goes all the way back to when um, N Nicholas was first turned, you know, way back in the 13th century, you know, and she's one of the, you know, vampires who he used to run with, and, you know, they had some on-again, off-again um, times together, um, but you know, they became friends and, you know, borderline lovers, and, you know, nowadays, though, she's actually running a um, nightclub um, that caters almost exclusively to vampire clientele, and, you know, she'll oftentimes, you know, have information on a case that, you know, Nick is working, and, you know, she'll be trying to, um, on one hand, I mean, she'll, she'll want to maintain her close ties um, with, with Nicholas, but at the same time, though, um, there is some tension there because, you know, Nick is refusing to give in to, you know, the nature of what he is, unlike, say, when, you know, he and Jenny used, 
would you know run run together and so you know she's you know constantly i mean she has no problem helping him but at the same time she there is a sense of frustration on her part because you know he won't just be what he is i mean he um you know he's trying to you know not be the monster that um she remembered him to be and he's also um oftentimes caring too much for the mortal world you know whereas you know the vampires are for the most part eternal and mortals are fleeting and so um you know she she's definitely a friend of his but at the same time you know it's a friendship that's not without its um quarrels uh, but nonetheless you know she does um f oftentimes you know find herself you know in his corner you know more often than she'd like to to be honest uh, but there's also a vampire named lacroix who was in fact a vampire who turned both uh, nicholas and jenny um all those years ago all those centuries ago i should say and lacroix was what you would call an evil vampire or at least as far as you know most people would define the terms of good and evil um but he was a very bloodthirsty individual and he ac acted you know freely on his predatory instincts and so you know a lot of um, the lessons they taught to uh, nicholas you know over the centuries um they stuck with him and you know and oftentimes lacroix actually you know saved nick's life but at the same time though you know, um, the two of them eventually became enemies because of uh, Nicholas's, um, you know, sense of remorse and guilt for the increasing amount of um, bloodshed that, you know, the trio, you know, committed over the over the years, and so uh, when Nick um, broke away from them, uh, Lacroix never forgave him, and you know he's just been continuing over the years to pop up, you know, wherever Nick is and trying to, you know, thwart his attempts at, say, overcoming the beast within or trying to find a cure for his vampiric nature. And so uh, Lacroix is seemingly killed off in, you know, the first two episodes, but um, he pops up, you know, in, in flashbacks, you know, that are usually in that are in most of the episodes and so you definitely see you know more, the relationship that lacroix had with uh, uh nick as well as Jeanette. um and you also get the feeling that lacroix you know still has a part to play in the story um even though he's seemingly you know dead you know as far as you know say the first two episodes are concerned um you know but you know, th those are the, the you, know, you know the main characters. I mean, and the the whole you know point of the of the story, uh, at least as far as first season goes, is you know Nick trying to find a cure for his vampirism, you know while trying to atone for his past misdeeds, you know while also you know trying to um, you know maintain you know a, a friendship with those around that that he um, has come to. Um, work with and care for and so you also um you, you follow in the footsteps of you know some of the supporting cast members as um the actions of um nick you know tend to you know go along with the cases that they're working on and how that how they themselves react to um you know, what transpires because of that but you know this was um yeah, that, that that's I mean that's kind of the rough outline, the rough plot, you know, overall. But uh, what usually ends up happening is um, the case that you know Detective Knight, as well as um, you know the the uh, supporting cast are you know working on. Um, oftentimes, there'll be something that that's happening in the case in the present that triggers a memory um, for Detective Knight um, that. You know, brings up something from the past and so you'll see him 
um, in different time periods, as well as um, you'll also see the characters of Jeanette Jenny or um, Lacroix in different time periods as well. And so that allows, you know, the um, production team to um, you know, play with costume designs and wardrobes uh, that reflect, um, you know, the eras, um, you know, from long ago. And I actually thought that that, you know, on one hand, that was very pretty cool from a production standpoint. Uh, it definitely made the show stand out in a visual sense. I mean, because, you know, you go from, you know, the nitty gritty, you know, present day, you know, urban reality um, of the then uh, um, setting of 1992. And then you go to, you know, say centuries back and it's a whole nother world. And, you know, they did a pretty good job with it. I mean, on one hand, you could tell, I mean, yes, it's made for TV, but there's just enough effort put into it to where um, you bought what they were selling. And it also made me think of um, some of the bits I saw from Highlander, the TV series, where there was a similar thing, you know, in the sense that, you know, the show would take place in the present, but there'd be a lot of flashbacks to the past and, you know, something from the past would tie into what was going on in the present and so on and so forth. Uh, and in the case of Forever Night, um, it's, there's a similarity to the Highlander TV series, but there are differences as well because um, something that goes on in the past, uh, or I should say something that went on in the past, um, while it might um, say remind Nick of say it, it, it might it might have um, have have an effect on how Nick perceives things in the present or Nick might be working on something in the present that makes him think of something from the past but it's not like the past is constantly um, you know coming back to haunt him um, it's just more like memories from the past are constantly popping up for him in the present but every now and then though this being a, van a show involving vampires uh, something from the past does come back to haunt him oftentimes something of an immortal vampiric nature and so um, because of that you also uh, see a rather um, interesting uh, cast of um, say, uh, I guess you could say one-off characters um, you know, people who, you know, show up in the present, uh, who, you know, maybe they were alive way back in the past, um, or, you know, sometimes it might be, you know, someone who just reminds Nick of someone from the past, but, um, it, it's fun. It was pretty cool, you know, just seeing how stuff like that would turn out. Um, yeah, but yeah, the, uh, you know, this oftentimes it, it made for a rather um, unique uh, show in the sense that you know even though the story itself you could tell um, what's almost certainly going to happen you know because of this um, you know ebb and flow of you know going you know from you know the present to the past and you know back again at least as far as you know Nick's memory goes. Um, it was a very fascinating show to watch on a purely visual level, um, but also um, because of the efforts of you know the acting of the actors involved, um, you actually, or at least I found myself um, caring about what happened and becoming invested. Um, so you know, speaking of the actors, um, uh, Nicholas Knight uh, is played by. Uh, Jorain uh, Wynn Davies, and he does a really good job in the part. Um, you know, he, the the way he plays Nick, I mean, the way he looks, I mean, he's, he's a very handsome guy, but, you know, not to the point of, say, um, Robert Pattinson, Twilight, you know, sparkly handsome, but there is a charisma to him, uh, sort of like a rough-hewn, uh, uh, private eye um, charisma, if you will, and you know, Jorain does a good job in um, conveying uh, the isolation that um, Detective Knight feels from, say, society at large, because um, there are certain things that he's not ever, not going to be able to um, fully ex um, experience, you know, because he's a vampire, and so, like, he's not going to be able to enjoy walking in the sun or, you know, going to the beach with, um, you know, say 
you know, someone they love and going for a, you know, a walk in the park or something like that. Like anytime he does something like that, it has to be at night. And also there's a fact that, you know, most of the people that, you know, he loves or has loved, uh, they've grown old and died over the years. And so with a few exceptions, he doesn't like to get too close to people. Uh, but the few people that um, have, you know, come back to him over the years um, who were with him in the past and tend to be vampiric in nature. And more often than not, um, there's a conflict that ensues because of that. And so um, Jorain does a really good job of just, you know, capturing that sense of isolation and um, reluctance to say, like he, on one hand, you know, he's reluctant to get involved um, with society at large, but at the same time, because of his job, I mean, he's trying to help society as well to fight crime and what have you. So it's an interesting, you know, sort of um, contradict contradiction, you know, to his nature, and uh, he does a really good job with it. But he also has, um, you know, a sense of humor uh, that makes his character more than a little likable. Um, and so he can be funny, um, you know, he can be, um, you know, charismatic, but uh, there'll be times though where you also see just how um, monstrous he can be. Like if something gets him angry um, and he vamps out, uh, Jorain does a really good job of, I guess, you know, tapping into, you know, say a, a real inner anger and man manages to bring that to the forefront and so i mean it's one thing to say you know have contacts on and you know fang like fake fangs you know like you know for props or something like that but to have all that plus you know an, a seemingly real anger you know being channeled you know through that character um that's actually pretty good work and so jorain uh when davies i mean he does a really good job of bringing detective knight to life um Let's see, uh, the actress, uh, Catherine Disher, uh, she, she's the one who played, uh, Dr. Natalie Lambert, and I really liked her character. Um, I mean, she was, she was beautiful to look at, very easy on the eyes, but she was also, you know, someone who, um, has a sort of, um, a distinctly, uh, snarky demeanor at times, uh, or actually, I guess you could say, I could say kind of, um, I'm not, I'm not sure if gallows humor is the right sense of humor, but uh, because of her profession, you know, her, you know, when she's working with, you know, forensics, I mean, she works with a lot of dead people. Uh, she has a distinct sense of humor that comes about because of that. Um, but, you know, she's a very likable uh, person. Um, you know, she gets along well uh, with, with those around her. And, um, you know, Catherine Disher, uh, she, just, uh, you just did, she just did a really good job of, you know, giving life to a character who, um, even though she works with dead people, I mean, she actually does care about the living and she, um, and, and you really bought the whole notion of her trying to, you know, help, um, Nicholas Knight find a cure for his vampiric nature. And there was a few, there were a few episodes that, you know, really, um, brought her acting talents to the forefront. And, um, I think one of the stands out, standouts for me was, say, there was an episode where you saw, you know, a series of flashbacks, you know, as to how and she and the Detective Knight first met. And, you know, you, you see, you know, her um, demeanor in the flashbacks, and then you see it in the present day, and it's a really good transition. And, and, you, and you really buy the fact that, you know, the two of them have become, you know, genuine friends. And, you know, say something that, you know, Nick thought that he wouldn't have again. And so, you know, she um, really, you know, brings, you know, some hope into Nick's life. And so, um, you know, Catherine Disher, I mean, she did a good job uh, as Dr. Natalie Lambert. She was definitely a fixture on the show, and it's easy to see why. Um, you know, Lacroix um, was played by Nigel uh, Bennett. And... He uh, just has a blast in his part. And the funny thing is, as I said uh, earlier, is that he's seemingly killed off in the first two um, episodes, but he keeps popping up in the flashbacks. And so, you know, you, you see this guy who, I mean, he's very charismatic in his own way, but there are times where you love to hate him 
because of some of the stuff that he pulls uh, to kind of screw with, um, you know, Nick's, you know, search for redemption or, um, you know, the removal of his vampiric nature. And, and so you love to hate him, you know, but then there'll be times where um, you just, you love having him around because of how, um, you know, darkly comical he can be at times, you know, rather morbid sense of humor. Um, but at the same time, there's a certain complexity to his character in the sense that, I mean, you know, he genuinely views Nick and Jeanette as, you know, family. And so, you know, when Nick, you know, broke away from them, I mean, he was hurt by that. And, you know, over the years, I mean, you know, even though he's found himself at odds with Nick, I mean, there's always the, you know, point of, on one hand, he wants to hurt him, but at the same time, he wants to bring him back into the fold. And, uh, you know, Nigel Bennett, I mean, he just, he, he was, he did a good job, you know, with um, his time on screen as LaCroix. And even though, at least as far as the first season goes, even though most of that is um, courtesy of, you know, the flashbacks, um, it's still fun to watch him. And there's the, you know, there's a, the possibility of him coming back um, from his death, um, at least as, you know, if the final episode was anything to go by. But uh, yeah, so Nigel Bennett, I mean, he was really fun to watch as LaCroix. You know, he was a good villain, uh, someone who was at once spooky, but also just entertaining as well. Um, and let's see, uh, Deborah uh, Dushini, uh, she plays Jenny, and she, um, I loved her character. Uh, I mean, she, she was very beautiful to look at. Um, she actually looked like what you would visualize as a, a seductive female vampire would look um but she also um you know the way she plays her part though um she does a good job of embodying that sort of um ethereal charisma that vampires would have and so there's a very seductive quality to her um but there's also a sense of um compassion uh especially you know, when you know say nick Nicholas Knight is concerned, you know, because in whenever um, Janae and uh, you know Nick are sharing a scene together, you buy the fact that the two of them have a history, and you buy the fact that um, there is a chemistry there. There's there's a relationship, and you know, at, you know, at times, you know, a romantic one, but as of late, it's more you know in the say. Um, close friends territory but um, at the same time though um, whenever she's at odds with Nick I mean you understand why she's at odds with him you understand uh, why she feels some resentment at times especially when he cares more about humans than you know his fellow vampires but at the same time though I mean the two of them have seen too much and been through too much for you know her to just cut him off and then um, it's interesting though that there's, there's, there are the occasions though where, um, because of say the necessity of plot, um, or say the case that you know Nick and uh, say you know Skanky are working on, uh, Jenny, you know, oftentimes, I mean, she'll sometimes find herself um, interacting with say you know some of uh, Nick's you know human um, acquaintances or friends. And it's a rather awkward situation for her because they don't know that, you know, vampires are in their midst, but and it, they think that they're just um, eccentric individuals, you know, much like, you know, say they, how they perceive, you know, Detective Knight. But at the same time, though, you know, she actually does come to um, have a certain fondness for some of um, Nick's human acquaintances, um, you know, more than it's a fondness that she didn't expect to have uh, but more often than not she finds herself annoyed you know whenever she's having to interact with someone who's you know straight up human but um but Deborah Duchin, um you know she just does a really good job uh, at the part of Jeanette, Jeanette and um you know like I said you know very easy on the eyes very seductive but also you know she does a good job of playing her character um as far as uh, say Detective uh, Skanky goes um uh, Jean Capellos uh, played him, 
And most people, um, myself included, uh, remember him, remember him from um, the the movie The Breakfast Club. Um, you know, he uh, he was the janitor, if I remember correctly, in that movie. And uh, but yeah, um, he does a um, really good job with uh, Skanky. Um, and it's it's funny because you know when you first see him, I mean, you're like, oh god, not this guy again, because. You know, he's one of the, he plays one of those characters who's having to crack a joke a minute, and only a few of them are funny. But then, as the episodes go on, um, it's like the writing got better. But also, you see that um, his constant um, joke a minute, you know, nature, um, it kind of uh, goes away to say, you know, trying to cover up you know, say, certain personal issues in his own life, and so, um, you know, you see that, and then you, you consider some of your interactions with, you know, those around you, and you know someone like that, and so, you know, I thought that, um, the way that, you know, Skanky was played, um, I thought that it made for him being a really good character, and, you know, it got to where it's like, okay, um, you do get annoyed with him at times, but at the same time, you kind of find yourself liking the guy in, in a strange sort of way. Um, and you definitely buy into the sort of the odd couple nature of, you know, him and uh, Knight, Detective Knight working together. Uh, but the two of them, they actually have a, you know, unique form of, you know, chemistry with one another. As I said earlier, you know, their natures sort of seem to rub off on each other. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. And so, um, you know, it's like the characters had good chemistry with one another, but that was a lot, a lot of it was because of, say, the writing, as well as, you know, the acting of uh, Jorin, uh, Wynn Davies and uh, Jean Capellos, respectively. And so, um, you know, Skanky, uh, you know, he, he was a, um, a good character, a very, um, you know, unique, you know, f I guess you could say, funny man to uh nick's straight man as it were uh but jean capellos uh, does a good job of playing him but also uh there was a as joan joe stone tree uh, captain joe stone tree um was the actor uh, gary farmer and i know i've seen him in quite a few things you know he's a very good character actor but you know, he's got that sort of heavy set burnt out you know grizzled quality to him to where i mean he plays the you know, character of uh, Captain Stone Tree rather well. Like he comes across as world weary and cynical. You know, but at the same time, you know, it's like, hey, you know, I've got a city to look out for. I'm gonna do whatever I can to get the job done. And so, I mean, you know, oftentimes, you know, whenever he's interacting with the uh, Detective Knight and uh, you know Detective Skanky, I mean, it's you know, there's a very you know, bit there's a sense of you know, oh crap, not these guys again. Or, you know, okay, what did they do this time? You know, that kind of thing. But at the same time, he knows that both of them turn in good work and they close they close their cases. And so he's able to overlook certain things, you know, certain irregularities. But at the same time, you know, there are times where he, you know, puts his, you know, fist down and says, okay, guys, enough is enough. You got to go by the book. Um, but over time, though, I mean, he becomes what you could call a friend to um, Detective Knight and Skanky, as well as, a, you know, Dr. Lambert as well. And so it's like the four of them, you know, as far as the police department goes, I mean, they make for a unique set of friends. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the characters here, the main characters, you know, all, you know, you know, very unique, um, very well written, well acted. And so, you know, as predictable as a lot of the plots of the episodes are, I mean, it's fun to watch, you know, because of, you know, the quality of the acting, you know, that's put into, um, you know, the characters on screen. But, you know, speaking of actors, though, um, there's also, there were a couple of uh, familiar faces that were guest stars on the show. Uh, Carrie Ann Moss from uh, The Matrix and uh, Memento. Uh, she pops up in one of the, you know, more intriguing episodes uh, involving addiction. And uh, James Hong uh, from Big Trouble in Little China and Kung Fu Panda, uh, he pops up in a rather uh, powerful episode um, 
involving um, something from Nick's past, um, you know, some, a murder uh, that happened a long time ago. And it's, uh, it's one of those deals where uh, James Hong, he does such a good job um, of just bringing this sort of, you know, haunted, you know, vengeful um, feeling to his character in regards to what Nick may or may not have done in the past. Uh, but um, also you have uh, David Hewlett um, from uh, Stargate Atlantis and uh, the movie Cube. Uh, he shows up in an episode as well. And so it's really interesting how you got these um, um, familiar faces that pop up here and there, and especially as far back as, say, 1992. Um, you know, but it's like, hey, I, I, I know you from such and such. Um, and it's fascinating seeing them on this show even if it's just for an, a single episode, but going from, you know, a guest star here and then what they eventually went on to afterwards. And so, um, you know, it definitely made, you know, the one-off characters, you know, more interesting. I mean, those were the big name guest stars that I could think of, but as far as just say, you know, one-off characters in, um, you know, the episodes, I mean, they tended to be rather memorable, but, um, but yeah, this was just a. I, I really enjoyed the, this first season, and um, I mean, yes, it, it's dated. Um, I mean, the main flaw is that it's predictable, but at the same time, um, I guess you could say that the other fl problem would be that um, the special effects are sometimes less than stellar, uh, such as, say, whenever, you know, the vampires are shown as, say, flying. Uh, well, I mean, it's cool, uh, but it's, it also at times can look kind of cheesy, especially if they're shown in, say, you know, if, if their entire bodies are shown flying. I mean, it's obvious uh, that, you know, the special effects for back then, I mean, they look very, you know, cheesy and low budget in that regard. And so um, when, on the other hand, though, when, say, the focus is more on the camera work. Like, like say, if um, the camera is supposed to be conveying, you know, a vampire, you know, flying and, you know, looking for something or hunting, you know, that's when it gets kind of cool is because, you know, it does a good job of showing what's supposed to be a vampire's perspective. But when you see the vampire, like, you know, in full, you know, full body and flying, that's when it tends to look kind of cheesy. Um, or when the vampire is moving uh, quicker than the normal human. I mean, you get the idea, you get what's what's going on, and, and you buy it, but you're just kind of like, yeah, things have improved a lot since, you know, 1992. Um, but yeah, I mean, other than those factors, though, I mean, I thought overall it was, you know, a, a good first season. And I think a big part of that might be because, I mean, you know, some people might not like this show, um, or at the very least, they might just, you know, say it's okay, you know, because of how dated it is. But I grew up on stuff, say, from the 80s or 90s. And so, I mean, I can definitely recognize when something is dated. But at the same time, I mean, if, if say, you know, the writing and acting are done well enough, I mean, I can forgive that. And in this case, uh, at least as far as the first season goes, you know, Forever Night... Um, does a good job of, you know, balancing out its, you know, predictable and dated aspects with, you know, say, you know, the well-written, um, you know, aspects and the, um, performances. Um, not to mention, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the, the soundtrack by Fred Mullen, um, you know, as well as, uh, whenever, uh, the vocalist, uh, Lori Yates is on hand, um, there were um, two songs in particular that I really um, liked um, as far as, you know, the songs themselves are, you know, fantastic, but they also fit rather well with, you know, what's going on, you know, on screen, you know, in Nick's uh, story. Um, you know, one of the songs was uh, Touch the Night, uh, and um, and the, the main Thing I remember from that song is, you know, there's a really cool driving, night driving scene where Nick's just driving throughout the city and the song's playing. And, you know, the instrumentals, you know, are, you know, they're, you know, composed by Fred Mullen are really well done. But then you got Lori Yates, you know, her, her lyrics, her vocals, and it's just, 
you know, it's a good combination because Nyx is just, you know, driving through the city and, you know, just thinking about things. And, you know, you're seeing all the Canadian, you know, sites, you know, of the city. And I've never been to Canada, but this is one, I was going to say, this is another thing. Uh, so Forever Night takes place in Canada, but it actually was filmed in Canada as well. Because sometimes you'll have a show that is supposed to take place in New York, but it turns out it was filmed in Canada and, or, you know, something like that. But no, this was, it was filmed in Canada and it was set in Canada. And so, you know, it just, you watch this and you feel like you're in Canada. But anyway, though, as far as, you know, that particular song goes, uh, Touch the Night, uh, wonderful night driving music. <laughs> Uh, they did a really good job with that. Um, and also just kind of, you know, tapped into, say, the allure of the night, I guess, for the nightlife for the vampire. Uh, because, I mean, there's a curse to it, but there's also kind of an interesting blessing to it as well. And so I, I liked how the music was used to sort of capture that. Uh, the other song I really enjoyed from season one was, uh, um, I think it was called The Dark Side of the Glass. And that song, uh, it's a rather you know, heartbreaking song, but, but the way it was used though, um, in the episode that I was in was, you know, very well done. It's, um, it really captured, um, Nick Knight's, um, sense of isolation from, you know, the humans that he's wanting to fit in with. Um, and there's this, you know, really, you know, it's a really cool visual moment because, uh, he's, he and uh, Skanky, they're they're watching this uh, woman perform on stage. She's a singer. It's at a concert, um, and uh, it's at night, of course. Um, and you know the woman's singing, um, but and, but as Nick's listening to the song, he goes into sort of this weird fugue state where he's kind of he finds himself in this weird surreal landscape of you know it's like a city street, uh, and there's all these you know shopping display windows filled with TVs and as he's walking through you know the street and looking at each TV you know he'll you'll he'll see people in the sunlight just enjoying their lives and you know and he's just you know he gets a sense of longing for you know something he can never have but but then it's like the people they'll be looking at they, like they'll be doing they'll be enjoying their lives but then suddenly they'll stop and you know turn and look at Nick and just kind of, you know, glare at him. Uh, and, and it's like, you get that feeling of, you know, he wants to fit in, but he's cut off from them. I mean, he, he, you know, he can't enjoy the sunlight, you know, he can't, you know, fully embrace, you know, the intimacy of a human, of a relationship with, you know, a, a human. And it's just, you know, it's a tragic, tragic, you know, it's a tra tragic situation, you know, for, you know, for him for sure. But you really get a sense of, you know, his, you know, psyche in this scene. And, and then, you know, it's like after, you know, they all glare at him and, you know, the TV cuts to static, you know, he'll go on to, he goes on to the next TV and it's the same thing. I mean, it's different, different people on each TV, but it's the same situation. It's like, you know, they'll, you know, he'll be looking in and then they'll be glaring at him and the TV will, you know, cut the stack and he'll just, you know, be having, have it, he'll, he's forced to move on. And then it snaps back to reality. And in all this time, the song, The Dark Side of the Glass is playing. And it's just, uh, it was a really powerful scene, I thought. But it was also just, it was a really good song. But it was just, you know, a really emotional scene. And it just, you know, went hand in hand and, you know, crafted a very surreal, you know, sorrowful moment, you know, where you really felt sorry for Nick. Um, and so you, rec and, and it's, and it's moments like that, I think that, you know, made me, you know, buy into the fact that, you know, Nick is someone who, you know, he's done some stuff over the centuries. He's killed people, but you, you buy the fact that he is trying, you know, to be better than that. He's trying to be, you know, someone who is a good person and he's trying to, you know, find the way to beat, you know, the monster within. And so it's like, you see the moments like that. You see scenes like that. You know, sometimes it's just a good scene. Sometimes it's, you know, a good, you know, bit of, you know, music, you know, but sometimes it just goes hand in hand and it really, you know, gives you uh, insight into, you know, his character. So, um, 
anyway though yeah just uh, a very unique show uh, at least from what i've seen of it so far in a good first season so i'm gonna go ahead and uh Oh wait! Before I give my rating, um, the the one uh, downside, uh, not necessarily with the show, but more along the lines of with the the set itself, uh, is that um, the 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 DVD set it it un at least as far as the first season goes, um, it unfortunately doesn't come up with the option of subtitles, which you know makes which is a problem because. Um, I guess it's the audio quality, um, uh, the, whatever the, whatever they used for it. It's just that, I guess maybe it's because it's really old or something like that. But there are times where it's difficult to understand what's being said. I mean, it's not all the way through, thankfully, but there'll be moments where you're like, you know, you're, you're trying to hear what someone's saying and you got a full blast and you can pick up enough of, you know, the dialogue to where it's like, okay, they said such and such. But at the same time, there'll be moments where like, I really wish I could use subtitles here. But unfortunately, this DVD set doesn't give you, you know, the options um, of subtitles. And as far as I know, uh, this is the only you know way to get, you know, to get season one. I don't even think it's on Blu-ray. Um, so, uh, you know, just bear in mind that the audio quality isn't exactly, you know, the best. Um, and unfortunately, the other thing is that there's nothing in the way of special features. Uh, or there's, I mean, it's bare bones as far as that goes. Um, I will say that um, just in terms of, um, you know, I guess you could say the, you know, box itself. I mean, I, I do like the cover art. I mean, very you know, eerie, very spooky looking, uh, but at the same time, very, um, intriguing. Like, you know, you, it's kind of drawing you in, you know, it's like kind of the allure of the night as it were, uh, which is fitting with a show of, about vampires. So, I mean, I, I did like the, you know, cover art here. Um, here's the back. But, uh, but there's a booklet in here as well. Um, and, you know, in the booklet, uh, it, you know, gives a, a synopsis of every episode or a, a plot description of every episode, uh, as well as, you know, who the guest stars are or who the main character, main stars are. So I did appreciate that. Um, so even, even, so even though, uh, it's a bare bones DVD set in, in the way of say, there's no special features and there's no s options for subtitles, you know, I did like how you know, you're able to, you know, look through the booklet and say, okay, this episode, you know, is about that and so on and so forth. So anyway, though, I'm going to go ahead and give uh, season one of Forever Night uh, four stars out of five. It was good. And I'm definitely looking forward to uh, season two of Forever Night, uh, which I'll be starting on uh, pretty soon. So um, thank you very much for taking the time to check out my review. Uh, got any questions, comments, please drop a line, let me know. And if you like what you see here, uh, please like and subscribe. But uh, regardless, um, you know, I, I hope you enjoyed it and uh, y'all have a good night. So, and I was gonna try and throw in a forever night joke, you know, with the whole good night thing, but I can't think of anything at the moment. But anyway, so uh, thanks for checking out my forever night review and y'all have a good night, bye.